Returning to the broadcast is Jeff Rich, writer, historian, content creator, recently retired Australian government official. Uh, his book just published is called 13 Ways of Looking at a Bureaucrat uh, Writing on Governing. The websites are theburningarchive.com, jeffrich.substack.com, and follow him on Twitter at Archive Burning. Welcome back to the Rebel Transmission, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I was in Texas having some Texas barbecue over the weekend nice. and, and slowly coming coming uh, back to myself. Uh, wh what's the word down under? Well, it's been really cold down here in Melbourne and everyone's been obsessed with the uh, the the women's soccer world cup soccer but uh, australia sort of lost to britain the old uh, imperial master um last night so there's a bit of disappointment as well as cold in australia but uh, more seriously there's a bit of a big debate going on down here about our foreign policy and um We've had a, a visit from, uh, I think it's a Republican senator uh, from the United States, Mike Gallagher, who uh, told a Australian-American leadership dialogue forum that Australia needs to put itself on a war footing in preparation for a war with China, which um, has uh, not gone down all that well, at least in some quarters, and, and sort of builds on the whole debate, I guess, around where Australia is going with its alliance with America and uh, the the AUKUS uh, uh, sort of treaty arrangement between Britain and and America and Australia and the big extremely expensive nuclear submarines deal that was uh, negotiated earlier this year or last year. So we're in a bit of a, a bit of a strategic quandary in Australia as to whether we're going to be a um uh, some people say we've already sacrificed our sovereignty to america through the nuclear submarines deal and other things um uh, but there are still some people who want to argue for australia to pursue a kind of a independent middle power foreign policy but uh, um it might take a bit of a, a heroic effort for that to happen yeah, I, I think you're correct. I'm trying to find someone had a great quote uh, relating to Australia being basically a vassal now officially of uh, the U.S. Uh, yeah. Hopefully I, I find it during um, our talk. But, I, you know, for me, one of my top developments that I'm following is, is just what you uh, described, what's going on in the indo the Pacific, I uh, just reading here, it says a new military pact between Japan and Australia came into effect this past weekend that allows the two countries to deploy troops to each other's territories. And so it's like they're now integrating more and more all of the military forces. I mean, you wouldn't be doing that if you were not preparing mm -hmm. for a fight. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just seems clear Um the West is preparing. They're preparing mm. for a fight. Uh, I just uh, interviewed Thomas Han Wing Polin, who lives mm. in Hong Kong. Um, it was a written interview, and he, you know, he gave some interesting thoughts. And he says basically his his uh, his uh, short synopsis. He says China has become the boogeyman because the empire's rulers regard it as the end game over and beyond Russia and. Folks that I have talked to have said the same thing. I've interviewed Dr. Francis Boyle. He said exactly the same thing to me three years ago. Uh, and so your, your further thoughts on the vassalization of Australia. Well, there was a, um, a meeting of the defence and foreign ministers of um, the United States and Australia uh, a month or so ago. Um, I think it, maybe it was May. I can't quite remember the date. Maybe it was June. And... One of the announcements there was that there would be a kind of US personnel integrated into one of Australia's sort of defence intelligence uh, organisations. And 
Uh, so effectively, uh, I guess, you know, <laughs> the, the, the US military are embedded in the <laughs> Australian government uh, bureaucracy um, and that created, uh, uh, that was, you know, uh, trumpeted as a, a great level of cooperation and trust by the Australian government, but it was criticised by some of the people uh, who've kind of gathered around like John Menadue's Pearls and Irritations website as major critics of this sort of direction in Australian foreign policy as, uh, I guess, the, 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 the end of Australian sovereignty because, uh, well, you know, they're, 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 um, they're actually embedded <laughs> in, in our bureaucracy. Um, and yeah, there are certainly signs of war. I mean, I think I saw some very aggressive comment from Elbridge Colby um, the other day. There's, I've seen this Nikki Haley say some, uh, frankly, um, offensive kind of stuff about China being, you know. Uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 an enemy, um, and they are certainly seem to be, um, you know, beating the tom toms of war. And uh, the part of the whole argument about the um, nuclear submarines deal is that it's not effectively defending Australia. What it's doing is forwarding, positioning uh, American nuclear. Um, you know, weaponry and forces uh, in Australia as an advanced base into the South China Sea because the, the, the nuclear submarine deal, very expensive, not very beneficial for Australia and effectively it doesn't provide a kind of a force to, you know, protect the coastline of Australia. It provides a force that enables uh, America and Australia to project force into the South China Sea. And, and that was fundamentally the criticism made of it by the former Prime Minister Paul Keating at, at uh, a kind of a big press club uh, event a couple of months ago. At, and he has become the sort of lightning rod for a whole series of um, critics who've come forward now uh, and have started to sort of oppose the, the government's policy. But whether they're going to be successful in making a change is, is perhaps a little bit more questionable. Yeah, you but, know, as, as, you, as you mentioned, the security integration, we've, we already had five eyes. I think it's up to 14 eyes now, including <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot of uh, European uh, countries. And you mentioned Elbridge Colby, the son of, the son of CIA director, William, oh, is he really? Oh, yeah, William okay. Colby. And I, I've been <laughs> meaning to actually, yeah, and I, I've been meaning actually to try and interview Elbridge. I know he follows me on, on Twitter, so I've just um, been busy and, and ha hadn't gotten around to it. So I'm going to try to reach out to Elbridge. But um, if you want to hold that thought, Jeff, we've got to jump to yep. our headlines. We continue our conversation with Jeff Rich. He just published his book. Uh, uh, book 13 ways of looking at a bureaucrat writing on governing and his websites are the burning archive.com jeffrich.substack.com and he's on twitter at archive burning so do bookmark his sites uh, or subscribe to his um, channel and email list uh, by, by the way jeff today i just always so busy i was traveling traveling again in a few weeks to washington dc for the first time to check yeah. out the hang out with the ron paul folks and I, I did purchase. I purchased your book, the Kindle. Oh. It wasn't sh cheap. It was twenty plus bucks. Um, yeah. But hopefully, by the next time we speak, we uh, find, you know, finally, I you know, I, I bought it this time, and by the next time we speak, we can. Uh, I'll have. I would have uh, re read it, and we can um, uh, discuss more uh, of your book. But I, fantastic. I, yeah, and uh, again, I encourage people to get it as well. And um, I did find that comment, and it did indeed come from uh, Thomas Han Wing. Poland. Uh, oh, yeah. He's got a great, I don't know if you know his Twitter, but he's got a, a really a great Twitter account and he's on Telegram and Facebook. And he's really, uh, for me, rare. He's posting really good stuff that I'm not finding elsewhere with his commentary. And uh, he did share, uh, it was an article from John 
menadu.com where you, you're also published there. And uh, Thomas's commentary was that what you were discussing, that this confab between the defense and foreign affairs chiefs of the U.S. and Australia, Osman 2023, he says that its main result, the near complete takeover of Australia by the U.S. national security establishment for prepping as a giant military base in its burgeoning war on China, Australia's tragic fate will doubtless be a template for other U.S. vassals in the Asia-Pacific region with some local variations. Here's looking at you, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Philippines, <laughs> you've been warned. Uh, whatever its other incompetencies, the Biden regime has been extremely competent at getting its allies to fall in line against Russia and China, even when it's mission uh, suicidal. So, um, yeah, uh, further thoughts yeah well it's it's all it's i mean i think it it's it's a it, yeah i agree with you about uh that that twitter feed I, I think i do follow it and it's a very pertinent comment i mean you know it's uh, the, there appears to be some i guess debate within the elites but whether uh whether it really uh, amounts to anything i'm not really sure there's a uh, the governing party, the Labor Party, is having a national conference next week, and there's uh, been a lot of kind of grassroots campaigning within that party to uh, kind of uh, step back from the AUKUS alliance and rethink the American alliance. But whether that really happens, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't put money on that succeeding. Um, but there have been some very prominent uh, people, including like uh, there was also on John Menon you an article by Michael Keating, who was actually a former, he's not related to Paul Keating, the former prime minister, but was the former head of the prime minister's department when Paul Keating was prime minister. But just coincidentally, they have the same surname. And he, he talked about how Australia really needs to rethink its relationship with America and resolve a kind of a contradiction between its defence policy, where it's all in with the sort of war against China kind of thing, uh, or, or in its foreign policy, where at least it makes uh, noises about um, uh, a, a sort of more multilateral sort of uh, arrangements. They, they talk about a multipolar region, if not a multipolar world. Uh, so I think this is kind of at the heart of it. And to some degree, it comes together in the uh, uh, confusion around concepts of the Indo-Pacific, which, you know, has been uh, pushed forward in a stage in American foreign policy these days. It's, it's referred to, you know, NATO wants to be part of the Indo-Pacific, even though it's in the North Atlantic. <laughs> and... Uh, it's been a big part of the Australian foreign policy uh, uh, over time. But it's a, to some degree, it's a very weird, uh, incoherent concept that is basically just a nice cover for American domination of the Western Pacific and containment of China. And I wrote an article on johnmenardew.com back in June, uh, which was called Australia Little Country Lost, which kind of compared the idea of the free and open Indo-Pacific, because that's what people say, that they want to keep a free and open Indo-Pacific um, against the enemy of China. Um, and uh, I compared it to the Holy Roman Empire, uh, because famously Voltaire once said that the, the thing about the Holy Roman Empire was it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And so I said about the free and open Indo-Pacific, it's not free. I mean, New Caledonia is still a colony. And, you know, what about some of these sort of vassal arrangements with Japan and South Korea and Australia, uh, Philippines? Um, and it's not open because, you know, there's the constant... Um, use of economic sanctions by uh, by America and it's not even the Indo-Pacific as in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean because it's can it's described in this really incoherent way as to exclude everything uh, west of Mumbai like the whole coast of Africa that is on the Indian Ocean and it excludes China and Russia who are two superpowers who have 
uh, as much of a presence in the Pacific Ocean as does the United States of America. So, um, but I, I, that's the kind of concept we have. And I, 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 I kind of think our foreign policy people, our security people really need to just um, come to terms with the new realities of the multipolar world, not just the multipolar region, but the multipolar world and take a good hard look at where we really are in the ocean and what the consequences of uh, either an economic war or an information war or a cultural war or a military war against China would actually be for our country. It would be utterly, utterly disastrous. And it would be disastrous for the United States ultimately as well, even if it might entrench the current sort of, um, you know, uh, military industrial complex type people in power. Well, in the event of war, I, I forget who I was listening to uh, last night. They were discussing... Um, world war three and they said the global south uh, will, will be the safest if there is a war you know yeah. united states north america europe russia china but latin america we're going to be pretty good i think yeah. africa so uh, yeah. but you mentioned nato and one of my again focuses obsessions uh is also nato yeah. uh, because i i believe i've also been in a way targeted by them having my podcast mm -hmm. mentioned in mm -hmm. the Associated Press for my interview with Francis Boyle. Uh, and it was written by, uh, the article was written by the Atlantic Council, NATO's think tank. And then a week later, I get banned from Patreon. So, you know, NATO seems to be one of the key nodes of globalism, mm -hmm. especially the military intelligence, cybersecurity, security function, information warfare. I mean, NATO is, it's it's globalist. It's not, you know, us or european it's a globalist institution and again thomas shared an article uh which i hadn't found uh, anywhere and it's called nato's future must be global from sepa i'm sure a globalist think tank and it's is it any surprise they're saying it should be global it should basically be a you know a, a one world army um and we could re rename it the new alliance treaty organization yes. yeah. and so new unholy I, roman empire perhaps. <laughs> the, uh, yeah the new unholy uh terrorist organization <laughs> I, I don't know but you, you you've brought this you've commented on this and i i'm i'm still not ready to put my foot down when it comes to nato i'm really on the fence because i've had top experts say um NATO is a paper, paper pussycat, mm. paper tiger. Mm. Uh, and then others say it's a formidable force. And I don't know if they've, they've got some technology or some ace of spades. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I feel like it's still too early to tell. It's, you know, we have to wait until, uh, what do you call it, when the boots hit the ground. And then we see, you know, what's going to go on between East and West. But I'm I'm still not. I would like NATO co to collapse. I'm not a fan. I probably just got added to another blacklist, but okay. Um, but what, what, what do you think of NATO's uh, strength or weakness? Mm, well, I mean, it's hard for me to, I mean, judge in terms of the military things. I mean, uh, but it, I mean, it obviously it contains the uh, the the biggest spenders militarily so presumably it has a fair bit of kit that it can deploy um and even if things don't go well it will cause an enormous amount of suffering if anything like that happens so uh, i'm not so sure uh how it um would um perform militarily but that's a bit outside of my competence. I've certainly heard people talk about it falling apart, but I don't know, things don't often, uh, you know, an alliance that's been around for however long it's been around, since 48 or whatever it was, 52, I can't quite remember, uh, 70 years, um, It um, it's not going to disappear overnight. I mean, I've heard, 
Colonel Douglas McGregor comment that he expects NATO to sort of fall apart and as a result of tensions of the war in Ukraine. But I just don't know if that would really happen because there are just so many interests and reputations and networks that will keep it together. So I suspect it will kind of uh, stay together. Um, and I guess it depends on the scale of uh, victory or defeat in some of the conflicts it's egging on in like Ukraine and uh, potentially in Taiwan that might determine its future because there's nothing worse for an alliance than military defeat I guess but um, it 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 um, uh, I guess my interest would be for God's sake, keep it out of the Indo-Pacific. <laughs> Leave those wars in the Euro-Atlantic. Not that it will. I mean, if John Bolton has his way and America decides to fight a nuclear war, then, uh, you know, the game's over for us all. But uh, I just, I, I, I feel one of the truest things that Paul Keating said in the, the former Prime Minister of Australia about the NATO summit was that, uh, the Indo-Pacific really does not need NATO's um, sort of militarism uh, imported into it. We have some very strong traditions of diplomacy and trade and dialogue and cultural exchange, and they're the things that we should build on rather than uh, a Cold War military alliance. So that be my view, but yeah. my, my podcast is probably going to get banned now. Don't you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we'll see in it and i saw um in your on your sub stack you've got your uh, i guess it's weekly your glimpses of the multipolar yep. world and you got key key points there and your first of course is the big story uh, which is related to nato yeah. and i guess we'll see if if nato if when when it expands into the indo-pacific i mean that tells us then by that action uh you know they're they're going full spectrum dominance they're going yeah. for global government and then the question is going to be who is going to stop them or are they going to burn burn the world um uh you know <sighs> uh, are they going to risk blowing the world up we're going to have to take a quick break yep. uh jeff uh, the website is the burning archive.com jeffrich.substack.com the book is 13 ways of looking at a bureaucrat writing on governing and you can follow jeff on twitter at archive burning we'll be right back it's our final segment with Jeff Rich. Uh, I've listed the websites again, theburningarchive.com, and check out his book, uh, 13 Ways of Looking at a Bureaucrat, just recently published. Phone lines are open. I, I noticed something interesting. You, you just post, uh, as well on that same Substack piece, that would surprise you most um, earlier in the week was uh, Michael Vlahos, the American historian and strategist, um, publishing an important article on the staggering losses in Ukraine. And by the way, I just got an email today from the Ron Paul Institute conference, which I'm attending. And uh, Vlahos will be there. So I'll be, able, oh, to really? actually, I'll be yeah. able to meet him in the flesh, probably take a photo with him. Colonel yep. McGregor will be there. I'm just looking Testing. at the list. It's pretty interesting. Jonathan Turley, Jeff Deist, uh, Max Blumenthal and his um, oh, great. partner, partner, I think Anya Parampil. Uh, and of course, uh, Ron Paul. So anyways, um, uh, basically, he discusses the the losses in uh, Ukraine, and you know, other thoughts on on. We talked a bit about the Pacific. I also am concerned about the decline of the Western world. It seems that Europe and the United States and Canada are being hit the most. I just continue to see people are putting out videos of the rising cost of living inflation is getting almost impossible to survive on mm -hmm. a people who have decent salaries cannot survive they cannot own homes they're just b b barely having their head above water uh as i mentioned over the weekend i was in austin for the first time and it looked like a kind of like the movie the purge or dystopia things mm -hmm. are expensive the amount of homelessness is, is it's it's bad it's i've never seen anything like it all over the place and so mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any thoughts i don't know how it is in australia are you know are, are people complaining about the cost of living in australia uh, your yeah look uh, it's definitely an issue i don't think it's as 
bad as it has been in Europe. I mean, partly because, I mean, Australia is a big food producer and, you know, I guess that kind of thing as well. So, but I mean, petrol is more expensive than it's ever been uh, at the moment. I was amazed at the price the other day. So it's certainly having an impact and uh, it's kind of messing with the, with the, federal government's um, kind of economic sort of strategy a bit. So, but yeah, all this stuff's going to put an enormous sort of strain on the societies and the political order. So you do wonder how that will play out, but um, it does seem, it does seem pretty difficult. I, I, I mean, I think I also saw something during the week on American life expectancy, which, has kind of tanked a bit um, over the last few years, partly because of, you know, I guess long-term health issues and, um, and uh, uh, you know, the sort of drug abuse issues, that sort of thing as well, suicide. Um, so that, you know, and it, there's been a dip, I guess, in many countries around the world with the COVID, um, well, since COVID, um, and um, but America is particularly bad, and it's the gap between it and you know uh, the other developed countries, so to speak, or not just developed countries. You know, China has quite high life expectancy, um, higher than America's. Um, is uh, it's quite staggering, really. So you do wonder how some of these sort of social strains gonna. Uh, express themselves both politically and culturally as well as just the, the, the you know, the difficulty of, of living as well. I've actually done a whole series on my Substack on uh, uh, as, as part of the sort of paid subscription to the Substack. I'm doing a kind of a series of articles on kind of the world crisis, looking at uh, seven dimensions of it and one of those is what I call social fragmentation and the sort of uh, increasing differences in, within society and the the weakness of uh, our traditional cultures and institutions to sort of bind people together like I mean if you like you know the nation used to be something that bound people together but now it becomes I guess, uh, a, a source of division between nationalists and globalists and populists and non-populists and that sort of thing as well. So, Yeah, I, I saw in that piece, uh, it's titled World Crisis Social Fragmentation, at least part two, and you mentioned is Peter Turchin right about social mm. collapse. And mm. uh, I've had Peter Turchin's books. I've got like uh, right behind me, um, I think like, like at least two of them in physical They've been sitting on my shelf for years. I haven't had the time yeah. to read them, but I knew that, you know, when, when you're looking at this stuff, you've got Neil Howe of Fourth Turning, uh, people like Peter Turchin. I mean, these yeah. are the people who, whose books you want to have when you want to sort of try and predict the future mm -hmm. and, and, and which way things are um, going, uh, as well as Johan Galtung. He's got a great book. I, I, I've, I've interviewed him and... Um, there's a whole bunch of others but um yeah, yeah. and and th yeah. they give us glimpses into this social collapse no yeah and i mean church intends to take a kind of a mathematical sort of cycle social cycle theory so like you know things go through cycles and predictable things happen at different points in the cycle and i, I tend to see history is a little bit more chaotic than that but um it, i mean his big point is you know, um, what he calls elite overproduction. And it's a similar kind of point to what Emmanuel Todd makes about the the increasing, like one of the big changes over the last 50 years has been mass higher education. So, you know, roughly half young people in Australia today go to university, whereas when, you know, I went through, it was much less than that. Uh, and there's not really necessarily elite roles for all those people, and this creates a lot of tension and conflict between elites, and that what he calls elite overproduction is often a source of endemic conflict in the society that leads to the collapse. I mean, that's essentially what his, 
his argument is, um, and uh, it's an interesting argument. Um, I, I feel it's it. There's a lot of institutional problems that fit this in America. I don't feel it's necessarily so true in Australia, but uh, I think it, it's it's a good idea. And look, okay. another another great person to read about all this is there's a. Uh, world historian Felipe Fernandez Mesto, who um, has written many, many great books about world history, and uh, including a great book about America, which is actually written from the. Uh, it's it's like a Hispanic account of America that sort of emphasizes how essential the Hispanic. Um, side of the story of, of the United States of America really was. Um, and I actually um, had the pleasure to interview him for my podcast earlier this week. And um, that might be something that uh, you and your viewers or listeners um, would also be um, uh, interested to check out. Um, I'm going to sort of release that interview over over two weeks and we talk about like the multipolar world and cultural change and all sorts of things. Um, so yeah, I think it would be of interest. But one of I think the points he made was the West has made a big mistake in alienating Russia and China at the same at the same time, and it just needs to kind of find a way to live with a little bit more equanimity with all the other more equal partners in the world rather than try to hold on to this 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 um, this kind of sense of itself as the dominant world power which was always a little bit of an exaggerated it wasn't ever really quite the reality but has led to some disastrous disastrous uh, you know decisions you know pride become pride comes before a fall so to speak so yeah uh, people should check that out at the burning archive podcast which i do as well as everything and i also release that on my um on my youtube channel as well yeah, I'll be checking that out, theburningarchive.com. And I was just going to add, you know, you mentioned Peter Turch and I had on, I think last week, Charles Haywood of the, oh, yeah. the house.com. Uh, he talks about foundationalism and as well as he calls it fracturing instead of collapse. And he talks yeah. about um, rebuilding. We're pretty much out of time. I, I, I we, we, you know, I, I did want to talk about some of the technocracy. You had uh, Tony Albanese, uh, Australia's prime minister, <laughs> saying if you were a dictator, he would ban social media i mean these uh. people are just insane the mask is coming off the gloves are coming off so let's uh, talk anyways, about that next time eh? <laughs> next time we'll have to talk about more dystopian uh, technocracy um but it's great to be able to chat with you um uh, every month uh, again tell us best places 30, 30 seconds left where do we, where do we uh go? probably best like? place to go to the burning archive dot com and i've got their links to my podcast my youtube channel the Substack and my books and articles so that's the best place and i've done a little renovation of that website in the last week or two well you're you're definitely staying busy keep up the great work i am signing off and steve malsberg is signing in <laughs> <laughs>